is hell a place of eternal torment? Well, the simple answer, as we believe, and we'll prove that tonight, is no. Uh, It's not a place of eternal torment and punishment. To someone who is rejected at the judgment seat, the original words translated as hell in Bible translations basically refer to the grave, that is the common grave of mankind. And the Bible shows that people in the grave are in a state of non-existence. Okay, so the first point I want to establish tonight is that God is love. From First the John 4 verse 8, God is love. God is not a God of torture and eternal suffering. God desires people to be saved and to draw close to him. If someone does not turn away from their wicked ways, God is not going to burn them in a horrible place of eternal sorrow forever where they are conscious. That would make God a God of hatred, a vengeful God, a God of pain and torture and not a God of love. And if we do believe that hell is a real physical burning place where an individual is conscious, it may give us a warped idea of who God is and what God's purpose is with the earth. We may believe God to be cruel and unforgiving if he puts a tormented soul to be burned in hell forever. And this could also alter what we believe to be God's plan and purpose and his role with mankind as well. We read about God's purpose with the earth in Numbers 14, 21. I'm sure we all know that quote well. As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Also Psalms uh, 72, verse 19 Blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. And also Habakkuk 2 verse 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So this is what God wants, for the earth to be full of his glory. And our purpose is in Mark 16 verse 15, 16. To go into all the world, preach the gospel, and to uh, believe and be baptised. Uh, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Now that's a pretty convincing start to our thoughts here tonight, to prove that God is love, and he wants the world to be full of his people who love him, to be baptised and to preach the gospel. That is God's purpose, and it's the complete opposite of what we will consider tonight. And so tonight we will consider what is hell, uh, where is hell, did the Jews believe in hell, What's the purpose of fire in the Bible? And then to close our evening, we will consider the gospel message. And so just a few important factors before we really get into our topic tonight. As we read in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 tonight, the dead are unconscious and so they cannot feel any pain. As it states, neither work nor reason nor wisdom nor knowledge shall be in hell. But instead, the Bible says, let the wicked be ashamed and let them be, let them be silent in their grave. Also in Psalm 31, verse 17. So let's put these uh, factors up on the screen. God has set death, not torment, in a fiery hell as the penalty for sin. God told the first man, Adam, that the penalty for breaking God's law would be death in Genesis 2, 17. He said nothing about eternal torment in hell. Later, after Adam sinned, God told him what his punishment would be. Dust you are, and to dust you will return, from Genesis 3. He would pass out of existence. If God were actually sending Adam to a fiery hell, surely scripture would have mentioned it. God has not changed the punishment for defying his laws. Long after Adam sinned, God inspired a Bible writer to say, The wages sin pays is death. And we all know that quote well from Romans 6, verse 23. No further penalty is justified because the one who has died has been acquitted from his sin. Romans 6, verse 7. The idea of eternal torment is repugnant to God. Jeremiah 32, verse 35. Such an idea is contrary to the Bible's teachings that God is love. God wants us to worship him out of love not fear of eternal torment. And the, the Bible also states that good people went to hell. The Bible uses 
the Bible was that used the word hell indicate that faithful men such as Jacob and Job expected to go to hell. Genesis 37, 35 and Job 14, verse 13. And also our Lord Jesus Christ is spoken of as being in hell between the time of his death and of his resurrection. Acts 2, verse 31. And we'll have a look at that quote a bit later. And so obviously then when the word hell is used in the Bible, it simply refers to the grave. And so we've established from Bible teaching that humans do not possess an immortal soul and that at death, uh, humankind totally ceased to exist. Therefore, there are no souls to either waft off to heaven above or to be dragged screaming into eternal hellfire. So what then are, to we, are, to, are we to make of this hell which is beneath? So the English word hell is derived from an Anglo-Saxon word helan, which simply means to cover or applies to any covered place. In Old Norse language, the word was also hell. The equivalent in Gothic was halijah. In Old German, it was hella. But in all these languages, the meaning is simply the same. So the word hell simply means a covered over place, the grave. So hell then is not a place of eternal torment. Such a concept is based upon mythology and not Bible teaching. It's where human bodies are placed after death. In the case of God's true and faithful servants, it is simply their resting place until the time of Christ's return, when they will be raised to appear before him. And so with all that information in mind, let's take a step back and break down the word hell. We know what it means now. We know what it means. It means the grave. So let's now turn to the Bible and look at what the words of the Bible uses to describe the word hell. So there are four words used. We have Sheol. I'll put them up on the screen later. We have Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, and Tartaru, or Tartarus. And we'll start by looking at the first word, Sheol. So Sheol, it's a Hebrew word, but when translated in English, it means pit or grave. Sheol in the Bible is translated hell 31 times, grave 30 times, pit 3 times, and graves once. So the total uh, occurrences in the KJV is 65 times. And then we have Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, which we read again. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, which is Sheol, whither thou goest. And we see by this verse that every single human being goes to the grave, or goes to hell, Sheol, at some point in their life. We'll then move on to Hades. So Hades is the Greek equivalent of the word Sheol. So in other words, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was speaking Hebrew back in the times of the New Testament. So instead of using the word Hades, he would have used the word Sheol. The word Hades is used 11 times in the New Testament, and it simply means the grave. Hades is translated hell 10 times and grave once. Now there can also be a bit of confusion around this word from the historical context of the word Hades. So before the New Testament was written, Hades was known as the god of the underworld in Greek mythology. Over time, certain pagan beliefs were intertwined with biblical teachings, leading to the distortion of sound doctrine. The earliest known written sources that mention Hades as the god of the underworld um, some of you might know this, uh, are the Homeric epics. The, we have the Liliad and the Odyssey, and they're two poems written by Homer. He was born in the 8th century BC. Homer was a Greek poet who is credited as the author of the Liliad and the Odyssey, two epic poems that are foundational works of ancient Greek literature. And Homer is considered to be one of the most revered and influential authors in history. So Homer's Liliad poem centers on a quarrel between King Agamemnon and the warrior Achilles during the last year of the Trojan War. The Odyssey chronicles the 10-year journey of Odyssey, king of Ithaca, back to his home after the fall of Troy. The poems are written in Homeric Greek, also known as Epic Greek, 
a fictional language which shows a mixture of features of the Ionic and Aeolic dialects from different centuries. And most researchers believe that the poems were originally transmitted orally. So Homer's epic poems shaped aspects of ancient Greek culture and education, fostering ideals of heroism, glory, and honor. However, these epics were based on older oral traditions and likely drew from earlier religious beliefs and mythology concepts. It's interesting to note that the Christian version of a burning hell has been adopted by these ancient Greek pagan religions. And so just to finish off this section about Hades, let's turn to Acts 2 verse 31, which we quoted earlier. So Acts 2 verse 30 to 31. this section is speaking about Christ. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with him, with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. If you remember the quote that we stated in Ecclesiastes, Everyone goes to hell. Everyone goes to the grave. Even our Lord Jesus Christ is no exception to this rule. But because, as we know, our Lord Jesus Christ was perfect, he was raised from the grave after three days, and now he sits at the right hand of God. So now we move on to Gehenna. Now this is where things start to get a little bit tricky or confusing, so hopefully I'll keep it simple for you. The word Gehenna is a Greek word made up of two words. We have Gi and Henna. Gi is the valley and Henna is Hinnom. So you put that together and you get the Hinnom Valley, which was a deep gorge to the southwest of Jerusalem. And it was also called the Valley of Tophet. Christ used this word Gehenna as a symbol for condemnation and destruction. And it is used 12 times. Nine times as the word hell and three times as the word hellfire. Um, and hellfire is mentioned in Matthew 5, verse 22. Now, as we know, the valley has a low history. It was a place of idolatry, injustice, and spiritual infidelity. It was here that child sacrifices to Molech were performed in the days of Ahaz and Manasseh. And that section of scripture is it's quite difficult to read. Uh, the torture that people would suffer because of this absurd theology of offering babies to Molech. In his attempts to please Molech, Ahaz actually engaged in human sacrifice, sacrificing his own son to the fire of God. And that is found in 2 Chronicles 28. Archaeologists have learned that Molech was represented by a golden calf, being the religion of Canaan. The idol had the head of a bull with outstretched arms. A fire burned in his hollow stomach, and then a child was sacrificed on his arms. This practice was stopped during the reforms of Josiah, and the valley became a dumping ground near the city of Jerusalem. Furthermore, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers during the siege in the days of King Hezekiah, all those bodies were piled in the valley of Hinnom and set on fire. Jeremiah also built on this history and said that if the Israelites did not turn and follow God, something similar would happen to them in Jeremiah 7. And indeed, after the slaughter of the Israelite people by the Roman military in 69 to 70 AD, this is what occurred. But it was not just the history of prophecies of this valley which made it a place of horror. Also, in the days of our Lord Jesus Christ, the valley was used as the city dump. The valley of Gehenna was not only filled with garbage, refuse, and sewage, but also filled with dead bodies that people were trying to dispose of, either due to crime, sickness, poverty, or shame. And so in the times of Christ, the city officials occasionally sought to get rid of the garbage and also cover the stench by igniting the refuse on fire. But since there was so much garbage, and since more was added every day, 
The fire never really died. It burned day and night, seemingly forever and ever. So now we move on to our last uh, reference of hell, which is Tartaru or Tartarus. Uh, there's only one reference in the Bible uh, of Tartarus. It's found in Second Peter 2 verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Uh, the ancient Greeks believed this was the name of the subterranean region, doleful and dark as the abode of the wicked dead, where they suffer punishment for their evil deeds. And it answered to Gehenna of the Jews. Uh, the words in 2 Peter 2 verse 4 where it says, but cast them down to hell. In the Greek that means thrusting them down to Tartarus. And the word Tartaru occurs, uh, as we mentioned, it's just mentioned once in the New Testament, though it is common among the classical writers. It's a verb formed from Tartarus, which in Greek mythology was the lower part, or abyss of Hades, where the shades of the wicked were supposed to be imprisoned and tormented and corresponded to the Jewish word Gehenna. It was regarded commonly as beneath the earth, as entered through the grave, as dark, dismal, gloomy, and a place of punishment. And so by looking at those four words of what hell means, we saw that Sheol means the grave, Hades also means the grave, we saw that Gehenna was an actual place in the Hinnom Valley. And as we just saw that Tartaru also means the grave. And so from that we conclude that hell in the Bible simply means the grave. And so next we'll move on to looking into the book of Revelation about the lake of fire. This concept pops up in books of the Bible such as Revelation and as we know quite well, the book of Revelation is a book of symbols. The book of Revelation is such a great book as it gives us these detailed images of future events. However, when we look into the book deeply, we need to remind ourselves that what John saw was a vision. It's not literal. Just to prove this, let's uh, turn over to Revelation 12 verse 4. Revelation 12, verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So from looking at that verse, surely that cannot be a literal thing that happened. This can't be taken literally, can it? As there are so many stars that are significantly bigger than earth. If that was to happen, then the earth would have been destroyed. Another example from Revelation being a book of symbols, if we turn over to Revelation 14, verse 10, we will, this will give us another example. Revelation 14, verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So is our, is our Lord Jesus Christ literally a lamb, or does this verse refer to his character? I'm sure we all know the answer to that one. And just as a quick side note, where it says fire in verse 10, that word fire can, it can mean a literal fire, or as, it's, uh, as it does mean, it's a metaphoric, metaphoric fire, which is judgment. And so with that being said, let's have a look at the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 15. If we turn over a few pages. Revelation 20, verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The vision in these last few verses of Revelation 20 contains an account of the last judgment, not literal but symbolic of the end times when we will all be judged. So the words and whosoever 
It means all people of all ranks and conditions. No word could be more comprehensive than this. It states the only condition to not be thrown into the lake of fire is to have your name written in the book of life. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're a prince, king, noble, if you're a sports star, frivolous, proud, sober, modest, humble, rich or poor, the the list goes on. If your name is not in the book of life, God says you will not be saved. And in symbol, be thrown into the lake of fire, or as we will soon see, be judged at Christ's return. So the words was cast into the lake of fire from uh, verse 15 also. That is, they'll be doomed to a punishment which will be well represented by their lingering in a sea of fire forever. This is the termination of the judgment, the winding up of the affairs of men. The vision of John here, it rests for a moment on the doom of the wicked and then turns to a, a more full contemplation of the happy lot of the righteous as detailed in the two closing chapters of this book. So the section from verse 11 to verse 15 in Revelation 20, I'm just going to list uh, the condition of things referred to. There will be a general resurrection of the dead, of the righteous and the wicked. This is implied by the statement that the dead, small and great, in verse 12, were seen to stand before God, that the sea gave up the dead which were in it, that death and Hades gave up their dead. All were there whose names were or were not written in the book of life. There'll be a solemn and impartial judgment. We will all be judged according to our works, strictly according to our character. They will receive no arbitrary doom. They will have no sentence which will not be just. This is the final judgment. After this, the affairs of the race will be put on a different footing. This will be the end of the present arrangements, the end of the present dispensations, the end of human probation. The great question to be determined in regard to our world will have been settled. What the plan of redemption was intended to accomplish on the earth, it will have been accomplished. The agency of the divine spirit in converting sitters will have come to an end. And the means of grace as such will be employed no more. The wicked will be destroyed in what may properly called the second death. No statements in the Bible are more clear than those which are made on this point. No affirmation of the eternal punishment of the wicked could be more explicit than those which occur in the scriptures. This will be the end of the woes and calamities produced in the kingdom of God by sin. The reign of sin and of death, so far as the Redeemer's kingdom is concerned, will be at an end. And henceforth, the ecclesias will be safe from all the arts and efforts of its foes. Religion will be triumphant and the affairs of the universe will be reduced to permanent order. The preparation is thus made for the final triumph of the righteous, the state to which all things tend and to the final triumph of truth and righteousness. And now nothing remains to complete the plan of the work but to give a a rapid sketch of the final condition of the redeemed. This is done in the following chapters, and with, and with this the work is ended. And so continuing our thoughts with the lake of fire. Uh, so Revelation 20 verse 10, uh, which reads, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever. And of course this beast which is mentioned is not a literal beast but is it is a representative of something uh, if we look at verse 14 now death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death well of course this cannot be true if we are going to take it literally because death and hades cannot be cast into the lake of fire so instead of these verses being literal they are symbolic of the time when we will all appear before the judgment seat at Jesus Christ's return to the earth. I hope that all uh, makes sense so far. Uh, So the next point I want to 
touch on is, did the Jews of the Old Testament believe in hell as an eternal burning place? And so let's just we'll have a look at this. The concept of a burning hell, as understood in later Christian theology, it's not explicitly described or emphasized in the beliefs of the original Jews during the time when the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, was written. The ancient Jewish understanding of the afterlife included notions of punishment, was diverse and evolved over time. In the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, the concept of Sheol is often associated with the realm of the dead, a place of shadowy existence for both the righteous and the unrighteousness. Sheol is not described as a place of eternal torment or burning. And so it is clear that this idea that hell is an eternal place of torment has evolved over time and definitely was not believed by original old-time Jews. That brings us to our next section of what we are looking at, and that is the, what is the purpose of fire in the Bible? The fire, as we know, is used for utter destruction and judgment, not for preservation of torment. Uh, let's turn over to Jude and look at verse 7. So Jude, verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? Is it still on fire today? Uh, of course not. Nobody would say that they are still on fire today. They were completely destroyed as it says in Genesis 19. And also, to back that up, uh, 2 Peter 2 verse 6 agrees by saying, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Fire is used for destruction. We have the example of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram in Numbers 16. Verse 35, they came out, and they came out of fire from Yahweh and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. We also have the example of the 50 soldiers in the times of the kings in 2 Kings 1 verse 10. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of the 50, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And they came down fire from heaven and consumed them and his 50. We have in Jeremiah 7, verse 20, eternal fire in the gates of Jerusalem. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast, and upon the trees of the field, and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. Jeremiah 17, verse 27. But if ye will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. Then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Is there still a fire in the gates of Jerusalem today? Of course not. The fire can't be quenched in the gates of Jerusalem. The fire was not quenched until it had consumed all that had been burned, and the fire is not now burning. And so just one more example of using the concept of fire. Uh, we have the idea of being burnt with hunger in Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, verse 24. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. So simply speaking, the concept of fire in the Bible is used for utter destruction, not for an eternal condemnation of torture. Even if a burning hell is a real place where people spend their whole lives being burned, the Bible says that hell destroys both soul 
and body. Matthew 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. No one is conscious, eternally burning, begging for mercy from God. That would be a cruel God who would do that, not a God of love. And so with that being said, uh, some of us might know the reference in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31. Uh, this is a reference to the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, let's, we'll turn this one up, Luke 16, verse 19 to 31. Uh, and some might say this is involving a person who is eternally conscious, who is in a burning agony. So a rich man, I'll just summarise it for you if you follow along. Uh, Luke 16, verse 19 to 31. So a rich man lives in luxury, while a poor man named Lazarus sits at his gate, covered in sores, and is longing for crumbs from the rich man's table. In the end, both men die, and Lazarus is carried to Abraham's side while the rich man is tormented in Hades. The rich man is in anguish and asks Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his family. For Abraham tells him that they have Moses and the prophets to guide them. And if they do not listen to them, they will not be convinced, even if some arise from the dead. Now, before we get started with this story, it is worth highlighting that this particular portion of scriptures is strategically placed amidst a collection of parables. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus was not a real-life account. As we know, a parable is a simple story with a hidden meaning. They are, using, uh, they are used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson. Jesus here is using imagery to convey his message. So if we are going to take this section of Scripture literally, we have some issues that we need to deal with. Uh, do souls have eyes, fingers, and tongues? Are the saved able to converse with the damned? If we look at verse 26, that tells us they can't. What satisfaction would there be for those that are enjoying eternal bliss to watch others writhing in agony? Do you believe that the rich man was so foolish as to expect righteous Lazarus to leave the comfort of Abraham's bosom? to spend time visiting the rich man in flames of fire. Tongue touched by fingers, water would not alleviate pain while it's burning. If you were tormented in flames of fire, such as a rich man was, would you only request a drop of water to quench your agony? Would you not a jug or a jar or even a handful of water be much more logical? The resurrection and judgment have not yet occurred. So no one has eternal life yet. Abraham's bosom is not a real place, therefore this whole scenario must be representative. Abraham was unquestionably dead and without his reward. Hebrews 11.39 tells us that. Abraham's bosom is used to represent a place of honour and is not literal. Therefore, other sections in this chapter are not necessarily literal either. If this passage is a literal description of an actual place, then the question arises as to where people go who lived and died prior to Abraham. Can one imagine rewarding the righteous by confining them to a place where for centuries they would be able to see the agony, to smell the smoke and listen to the screams and shrieks of the damned as they scream for relief on the other side of the grave chasm? The central theme of this chapter does not revolve around the existence of heaven or hell, but rather focuses on how individuals will react to the word of God and understand the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 31 of Luke 16, And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So that sums it up in a way, and I hope that convinces you that hell is not an eternal uh, 
place of torture or misery. God is a God of love, and we are told to have a character like him, not a character of hatred and malice. So the question now is, how do we get our name into the book of life, as mentioned before in Revelation? How do we get accepted in, by God into his kingdom at the judgment seat? Well, even though this is a whole other topic in itself, let's touch on the gospel teaching of the Bible and to end on, we'll end on a more positive note and hopefully give us direction as what to do next. So just to we'll summarise what the gospel is because that's a, it's a very big topic. It has two parts, the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. We, over time, through studying and learning, need to learn all about the gospel. We need to learn about Christ's teachings, his example, his sacrifice, and come to an understanding. Once we have... Once we have done this, the only logical next step is then to choose to be baptised. The gospel shows us that we are sinners and the only way we can be saved is through baptism in Christ. And why would we want to do this? Because we don't want to die. We want to be a part of a kingdom that is so glorious and perfect. It can be hard to even imagine. A place where we can live forever and no longer struggle with the mortality and frailty that we have. We can build our knowledge of the gospel through continual Bible study and attendance to lectures, classes, Sunday mornings, youth groups, Sunday school, discussion about God's word with others, daily readings at home, and praying so you can develop your own relationship with God. It is always important to always ask questions, and there are many people in the hall tonight who would be happy to chat with you. Faith simply defined means believing in something that you can't see. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's having a belief and hope in God and the things to come. Our faith will grow and mature over time. And each one of us here who is baptized will testify that our faith is constantly growing as we learn more about a Heavenly Father. Our faith depends on careful meditation of the word of God daily to grow, as seen in Romans 10 verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. When Jesus returns to the earth, we will all be judged. We'll be judged according to our works and our obedience to God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body According to that, he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Before Jesus went to heaven, he instructed his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And everyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. The gospel, as we said earlier, is all about the name of Jesus Christ and and God's coming kingdom. So once we learn and develop an understanding of the gospel... A next logical step is to obey and choose to be baptised. The simple act of baptism is a symbol of the death, burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are putting away the old man and putting on the new. Once we come up out of that water, we are, an, we are as a new man or a new woman in Christ, a brother or sister ready to dedicate our lives in faith and works to God. And our faith will continue to grow and develop the more we learn, meditate, and communicate with God through prayer. Once baptised, our name is written in the book of life, as seen in Revelation. When God sends his son Jesus back to the earth, we have to be found ready and waiting. We don't know when this time will be, but we need to make sure that we are found ready and waiting, doing our best to serve him in our everyday life so that when we come before the judgment seat, we will be found worthy and through the grace and mercy of God, uh, through his will, will be accepted into the kingdom and made immortal. The kingdom, as we saw, is going to be better than we could possibly imagine with our mortal minds. So do you think you need to be baptised and saved? Do you struggle with sin and the mortality of the human race? Do you wish for a better time and a better place? Do you wish to live forever and not die and be in the grave forever? Then our next step is to learn, to study, 
and God willing, choose to be baptised so we can be a part of the glorious hope that the Bible promises us. And so tonight we have asked ourselves if hell is a place of eternal torment. And I believe that we have shown that never once does the Bible suggest that hell is a fiery place under the ground that bad people are sent to, to live in torment once they die. We looked at how all the translations of the word hell indicate being covered or buried underground. We have shown that God is a God of love and would therefore never send someone to eternal torment in a fiery place. We know if we want to be a part of the glorious hope, the Bible promises we need to believe and to be baptised. When Jesus returns, the faithful will be raised and gifted eternal life in God's kingdom. Thank you.